this panel will address more the target side issues that um, companies face when trying to protect themselves from breaches, um, and also after breaches occurred, how they should respond to it. Uh, so tonight, our, oh, I'm a, I'm a 3L here at Brooklyn. I'm one of the Trade Secret Institute fellows, Brittany Lashinsky. Um, and we have Alexander Southwell from Gibbs and Dunn, Joseph DeMarco from DeVore and DeMarco, and Austin Burglis from K2 Intelligence. Uh, so I'd like to ask each of you guys just to give us a short introduction about you and how you got into the cybercrime practice. Sure. I'll oh, yeah, start. Sure. sure. Um, so I'm Alex Southwell. I'm a partner at Gibson Dunn, and I run our uh, practice, which is uh, called Privacy, Cybersecurity, and Consumer Protection, and it covers sort of a wide range of those uh, issues. I also have a, a white collar practice uh, that's quite active. And my background, like Joe and uh, uh, like Austin, is I was an AUSA in the Southern District of New York and got into doing the cybercrime work there. Um, the way I actually got started is when you're generally when you're a federal prosecutor in your early days, there is uh, there's something called duty day when you're on duty and basically whatever walks in the door, uh, you know, is yours. And I'm actually was trying I was thinking about this whether it was Austin who walked in the door on that day. <laughs> quite possibly. Uh, and I think it quite possibly yeah. was. And that was uh, he mentioned earlier that he uh, did a lot of child exploitation cases, and I. Uh, uh, early in my career in the U.S. Attorney's Office got involved in a lot of child exploitation cases, investigating, prosecuting those cases, which all had a sort of a technology aspect to them. Um, and I did a trial that had a, a virus defense. Essentially, the defense was there was a virus on my computer, and that was why all of this terrible stuff was there, and therefore I'm not guilty. That defense. I remember that case. Yeah, yeah you remember <laughs> that case. Uh, that did not uh, go so well for the defendant. Um, and from there, I started doing many more of those types of cases. It, there's a sort of a somewhat of a steep learning curve, and when you get into it, it's uh, very engaging and you know challenging and uh, you know rewarding work to do. So I went on to doing other types of computer hacking and intellectual property cases, and continued throughout my career. I was also in the securities fraud unit, but also continued doing the computer hacking and. Uh, the IP cases. And then when I came to private practice, I started a uh, practice that focused on it and, you know, counseling, you know, Fortune 500 and uh, much smaller uh, clients about all manner of privacy, trade secret, cybersecurity uh, type events. Uh, and happy to talk more about that, but that's, you know, the nature of how I first got into it. So my name is uh, Joe DeMarco. I'm a partner at DeVore and DeMarco, and um, I've been uh, at that law firm, which I founded uh, in 2008, since that time. Before that, for 10 years, I was also uh, an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York. I started there in 1997 and left in 2007, and really, from about 1999 on, focused exclusively on cybercrime prosecutions, as well as prosecutions involving piracy, of intellectual property and theft of trade secrets. Uh, I got into the field purely by accident and happenstance, and I think one thing that's interesting uh, to note, and I do know whenever I speak with students, is that you, know, you can plan all you want, but it really just kind of is often the case that life takes you where it goes. I started my career after clerking on the Second Circuit at Cravath, Swain and Moore, and just by random happenstance, the partner who I worked for uh, initially and then subsequently for four years there, happened to be one of the partners who really just did work for IBM. And it was a steady diet of technology litigation for IBM uh, back in the early uh, 1990s, so before the dawn of the modern e-commerce era as we know it. Um, and when I got to the firm, I said to him, I said, you know, you do understand that I have a liberal arts background. I'm not a computer programmer. I'm not a computer scientist. <clears throat> he said, don't worry about that. You know, we really, we don't need computer scientists to do this work. The work we need to do is work done by people who can think logically, communicate clearly, analyze problems, figure things out, and then communicate those problems and the legal concepts behind them to judges and juries in an intelligible way. The IBMers will teach you everything you need to know about computers. And you'll go to classes, you know, maybe once a month, maybe twice a month up at their headquarters and you'll learn about new technologies. Uh, and everything he said was true. And so for four years I, I worked on a steady diet of IBM litigation, technology litigation, and 
regularly, once or twice a month, I would go up to you know Armonk or White Plains for a day and just sit with computer scientists, and I would hear these crazy stories about how you know your whole way of shopping is going to be changing because computers are going to be like web stores, and you're going to be able to buy things from them, and you know there are going to be devices where you can talk into like Star Trek, where you see people's images. And I was, you know, in my late 20s, and I would just sit there and just say, yeah, right, when pigs fly, you know. And of course, <laughs> everything happened. I mean, everything literally happened that, that, um, that they said was coming down the pike. When I got to the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, it was the dawn of the modern kind of internet era. Um, in 1999, most of our prosecutions, not all of them, but most of them were targeting uh, and going after people who were committing cyber crimes for, uh, for the kicks, for the bragging rights, uh, and the like. Um, one of the first, first prosecutions I worked on involved a guy who was hacking into the uh, computer servers at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, um, not for any nefarious theft of trade secret or you know, kind of cyber espionage reasons, but just because it was cool and he wanted to kind of brag to his friends that he hacked JPL. And because NASA had good pipe and he wanted to host his digital pirated music uh, you know, cache uh, of, of storage on the uh, Jet Propulsion Labs servers. What he didn't bank on was the fact that the computer servers he broke into actually happened to be supporting the life support systems on the space shuttle. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, NASA takes it very seriously when you hack into those computers. And so he was arrested and prosecuted. I left the office in 2008 uh, and for, for the last uh, eight years have been spending all of my time helping companies and organizations uh, figure out the legal issues behind cybercrime. And about a third of that involves uh, cases involving the theft of IP. Uh, you know, of those third, 100% of the clients think that their IP is a trade secret. Uh, and I think one of the challenges in this area is to kind of, as a lawyer, never you know, kind of lose your independent judgment and, and persuade and talk your client through whether they really have a trade secret or just merely confidential information that they lost. Uh, but that's, in a nutshell, uh, how I got into the field. I think I'll pass, yeah. right? I mean, I don't want to hear yeah, from me to again. Hear again. Oh, it's Joe. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to start out asking you guys, what is your role uh, as the attorney or also on the advisory side, uh, Mr. Burgless, uh, pre-breach, so before anything's happened? Anyone? Uh, I'll jump in. I mean, we talk to clients regularly about planning, about being ready, about having uh, a plan in place and uh, we refer to them typically as an incident response plan. Uh, and the primary reason is that when a breach happens, it's sort of too late to get organized, right? You want to be organized before something happens so that when something happens, uh, you know, because it's not generally if, it's, it's when, you're ready to go. And what that means is, depending on the size of a company, talking about who are the relevant players who would serve on a team um, making sure you've got the legal function sort of uh, embedded there uh, and you're thinking about privilege questions, making sure you've got something as basic as all of the relevant player cell phones uh, in one place so that if an incident happens, you can sort of get, uh, uh, reach out and make contact with all the right people. Um, and talking about them, uh, to, to them about getting a, a provider, sort of a digital forensics provider, K2 intelligence, you know, on board uh, uh, at the outset so that uh, they are ready to go if an event happens. They don't have to go out and find some provider. Many companies have uh, procurement policies that require that they get three bids and things like that, and so it can become cumbersome. And so if you do that kind of pre-planning or incident response planning ahead of time, that can be very valuable when an incident happens. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, you know, having a good incident response plan is critical to uh, to having better outcomes than worse outcomes. Um, and I and I always advise clients to have that. And, and that is a process that you take a client through from, from really from re from beginning to end. And then of course you train on it in, in a tabletop exercise or some type of simulation where you simulate a data breach. What I also do with clients is um, is I say to them, you know, particularly ones that are you know concerned about either hacking or the theft of trade secrets. I just really sit down and I say to them, you know. Tell me your deepest, dark, darkest fear, right? Like, what are you really afraid of? You know, in the, in the kind of, when you wake up in the middle of the night, uh, you know, when you're just kind of, you know, plagued by some thought, what is your worst fear? And is your worst fear kind of like maybe the fact that you're bringing on a new bunch of employees from a company that you took over and you don't really have trust 
in them, or is your fear that you're about to be, you know, letting people go, maybe in a mass layoff, and God only knows what those people are going to do out the door, is your fear that you're going into a new market, and, you know, you hear that this new market is just kind of rife with hackers and nothing is secure there. What is your deepest, darkest fear? What's your deepest, darkest fear? Because once you tell me what your deepest, darkest fear is as it relates to either computer hacking or the theft of trade secrets, then I can actually start to build uh, an instant response plan and put in place some protections that can help you not you know, eliminate risk, but contain mis risk, control risk, and then also be in the best position so that if something bad does happen and somebody comes a complaining, you have a good answer. Right, as to why you did the things that you did. So I, I, you know, I, I asked them, what's your deepest, darkest fear? As it relates to the law, I don't ask it more broadly than that. <laughs> so from the, uh, the investigative and, and, and technical side, um, we, we, we do the, the same type of uh, advisory services as Alex and, and Joe just described about the running through the plan. But we, we, we take it um, um, a little more uh, from, from technical. So. I see it as, as kind of three areas where uh, a private company can help an organization, and that is uh, a term that I'm going to use that I hate. It's called left of boom, which is uh, everything prior to an incident um, with, in the assessment side, uh, and then you have your incident response, and then your, your third piece is kind of the remediation and the eradication and, and cleanup and, and happily ever after. But in the assessment world, things prior to a breach, um, we take an external view of an organization and an internal view. Uh, we want to start very simple, uh, basically by jiggling the doors and seeing what doors are, are, are unlocked. Um, that's typically uh, a vulnerability assessment, is having an external look to the attack surface of that organization and to tell them that there's known vulnerabilities or unknown vulnerabilities that we've identified the next step would be uh, a penetration test, which would be actually having our team try to break in, uh, not, for the, not for the purposes of stealing or damaging, but for identifying that second layer, or looking to see what applications are present at that internet layer, uh, exposed just underneath, let's say, a website. Um, and then we look internally um, to see um, if their policies and procedures are in place. Um, and then also architecturally, um, uh, that that servers are configured properly and firewalls and routers are all configured and talking properly because uh, misconfiguration is one of the top three um, causes for uh, for incidents that we've seen. Um, so we look at that as a as a major step in the in the pre-assessment. Something else that we we uh, we do, which is um, which has always been done in the kind of the corporate investigative side, which is due diligence. Most of the time people are doing due diligence about employees that they might hire or contractors. We look at it as from a cyber due diligence angle uh, with all the mergers and acquisitions happening and, and uh, the third party relationships, uh, the joining of networks uh, with third parties. Um, due diligence of that third party and, and, and getting external looks at the hygiene of the company that that you might be merging with or, or accepting data from because you don't want to accept, you know, you, you don't want to link your network with a company that's ripe with, with disease and malware. Um, so that is a large part. And then from the employee side, um, we do a lot of training, a lot of spear phishing uh, training, and I know we're going we're gonna to get to that. And we also do a lot of um, tabletop exercises, and that is r actually running the incident response through its paces. And actually, let me add one additional point, which is one of the things you really want to talk to the clients about, uh, I'm sure we all do this, is, is, is where, are, uh, where are the trade secrets, right? Where is the sensitive information? Is it uh, you know, an aerospace company that has designs for fire suppression systems on airplanes, which is a client I had that whose uh, trade secrets were, were stolen? Um, or is it you know, an internet retailer who uh, primarily they have customer data? Or is it a data aggregation company that has you know, massive quantities of personal information that's all you know, uh, cross-filtered and, and you know, aggregated? Um, what is it that the bad guys might want to look for? And one of the challenges, but also you know, sort of what makes the area sort of exciting is that 
what the bad guys are looking for is always changing. And so you have to be cognizant of that. And for example, the Sony hack you know, of the last few years demonstrated that oftentimes you have more uh, politically motivated hackers who are not necessarily looking to get something that's valuable that they can monetize. They're looking just to cause damage and they're looking to uh, expose uh, to public view the inner workings of executives or a company and basically tarnish reputations and cause other mischief. And so that what that means is that it's just everybody's regular email that then becomes the most valuable. So it's less about whether they've got some secret recipe for a product that they have locked away in the vault, it becomes the regular email traffic amongst the executives that is the sought after <coughs> items. And so you wanna have that kind of discussion with the client as well so that you best understand what they have that might be attractive um, to the bad guys. Uh, and from that conversation, you can try to help them think about ways to best protect those items. And, and so even a client that is not, you know, kind of R&D, industrial design, or kind of, you know, technology company is going to have that information. I helped a client a couple of years ago. It was just a, you know, big old manufacturing company, no R&D, no real trade secrets, so to speak of, that you and I would kind of ordinarily conceive of as trade secrets. But because of a permission misconfiguration and a change management snafu, for about a 45-minute window in the middle of the business day, every employee could have the ability to log into the online paid time off database and see everyone else's salary, right? <laughs> now, you know, for the most part, that's not going to be a trade secret, right? I mean, very thin, maybe in some crazy scenarios, that information could be a trade secret. Um, in the context of this company, it really wasn't. Um, you know, we had to do an analysis for the client to see whether or not there was an obligation to report to any state official as a result of breach notification law. And I, you know, was happy to report to the general counsel that there wasn't, for reasons I won't go into, we fell within, you know, some of the holes in those laws or gaps in those laws. And I said, so, you know, I said, so your problem is basically solved. And he said, no, my problem is not basically solved. I still have to find out who is looking at whose salary information <laughs> because we're coming up on bonus season. And let me tell you, you know, I need to be prepared for that. Um, I mean, again, obviously a serious morale issue, um, not something you'd ordinarily think of as hardcore trade secret information, right? Um, but again, that kind of gets at understanding your client and asking the right questions because those answers are going to differ <coughs> depending, on, depending on the context. So I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the incident response plans also, because it sounds like such a crucial part of the assessment stage. Um, so how many employees does that cover? I mean, is that something that incorporates all of the employees of a company or only top executives? Kind of how far does that reach? I mean, generally it should cover everything at the company, right? Should, so it should be a plan for any incident that occurs at the company. And what you want is you want to have an incident response team that's made up of a select group of people who have authority and responsibility in the relevant areas. So you want legal involved, you want communications involved, you want IT involved. Uh, you know, there may be other uh, core groups that you want to have involved depending on the nature of the company. Um, but you want to have a plan that's going to work. I'm a big believer in a plan that is what I refer to as culturally sensitive. And by that I mean it has to fit with the corporation's culture. It, and because if it doesn't, if it's just something that, that I grab from another client and hand to them, it's not going to work. Nobody's going to follow it. Um, and so by way of example, there's a major retailer um, based in Arkansas that we do a lot of work for, and they uh, have a big uh, binder that covers absolutely everything that might happen at a store, from a kid goes missing, to a tornado, to an earthquake, to a data breach, right? And that's part of how they operate. And they know that that's where they can find what they need to find in the event of some incident. Um, you know, versus another company who's a startup and they don't really have any policies. They just, you know, they started as, you know, uh, you know, four guys and girls sitting in somebody's dining room. You know, that's a different kind of company. Um, and they maybe they've grown to be 300 people and the latest hot, you know, uh, hot app or something like that. You have to be sensitive to what they uh, can use effectively and what will work in the event that there is uh, an incident. So it's not a one size fits all. There's no standard for an incident response plan. It has to work for the company. But the basic premise of 
get legal involved, get the right people active on the problem, assess the problem, try to close whatever holes exist, figure out what happens, consider contacting law enforcement, you know, getting legal, both in-house legal and outside, uh, you know, counsel involved. Those are sort of some of the fundamental elements. And I, I think one Go. area where I see a lot of companies go wrong is they'll have that, but either the right people don't know about it, um, or it's not tested, or when an incident happens, they just forget to look at it, or they fail to escalate. Um, and I think you know, oftentimes a lot of a lot of problems that come across my desk could have either not been problems or been much smaller problems had the right escalation happened at the right time. I remember about um, not this past summer, but the summer before. <clears throat> Uh, it was maybe like mid-July, and I got a frantic call from a, a general counsel of a global company in New York, and he was telling me that the one of their country's subsidiaries had just reported to him that the entire customer database, a B2C company, the entire customer database of that country was stolen and was being offered for sale on the dark net. Account numbers, national ID numbers, credit card numbers, phone numbers, everything, right? Everything you would use for billing on, you know, let's say your utility or something like that. Um, and I said, okay, well, that's, that's obviously very, very important, very serious, we're gonna get right on it. And I said, you know, one of the first questions I asked was, and this is now around July 4th, I said, when did this happen? And he said, well, it happened May 15th. And I said, well, why are you calling me now? It's like July 10th. And he said, I just found out about it from country management an hour ago. And I said, so wait, let me get this straight. This happened, you know, two months ago. Country management knew about it for two months, and you just found out about it at the global HQ level an hour ago? He said, yes. And I said, well, I said, you know, we've, we've obviously, you've obviously got a lot on your plate because now you've got like a GC, right, who's handling not only the crisis, right, but the crisis about the crisis, which is why did country management sit on this, you know, little, little present for two months? And, you know, the answer was, well, we didn't want New York to worry, you know? <laughs> and that's not a good answer, right? Um, and that's not a good answer. Um, and, and it made our job a lot more difficult, right? Because, um, you know, not only now were we dealing with a foreign language, foreign culture, foreign law, but all the decisions we were making were based on information that's two months old. So it really does limit some of the things we can do on a proactive level, right? Like if I called you, Austin, and said, so you guys are gonna get right on this, right? And you, told, you asked me, well, when did that happen? And I said, no, two months ago, right? I mean, Little fewer tough. options, right? Yep. Yep. And I think just one thing to add on the incident response is, is what we find is it, is it forces organizations to have a conversation that we say they should, which is, um, having early and frequent conversations between their legal folks and their technical folks in the C-suite because the first time that uh, general counsel um, hears the term log or firewall log or something like that should not be the day after a breach is reported. Um, so educating the in-house counsel and, and because what, what is always the case is that the, the IT folks in an organization um, nothing's wrong, everything's perfect, everything's, you know, butter and roses, and, and their software is perfect. And, uh, and that's what is reported up through uh, the chain of command all the way up to the senior levels. Mm -hmm. um, so the conversations and running through incident response plans uh, really starts to ask uh, questions of, of, each, of each individual kind of silo to make sure that they're talking. And um, also, Mr. Burgos, you're talking about the technical aspects before of assessment. It sounds like you need some serious experts working on that. Um, so is that something that you help companies get people who are trained, or do you guys help train people in-house? Um, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, so um, we, we don't uh, train up uh, uh, people to do it, because that would be against our business model, right? We want to do it. Um, Fortunately, um, most organizations um, know enough that um, they need outside help when, uh, when having an external look because it's no good in having people who know your network inside and out or think they do testing it for holes and, and, and problems. You want a third party to look at it. And, and there are companies out there that have third parties look at third parties. So companies who have uh, managed uh, security providers um, who uh, oftentimes get comfortable because they have three or four year contracts inside an organization and, and provide their security and again tell everything tell the company that everything's perfect 
you have a company like a, a K2 or some other company come in and test that uh, and poke holes in that environment, um, it's, 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 nobody has the right answer. Nobody has 100% um, security. You want to do, just like you're building up from the inside, technically a layered approach, you want to do that with the testing as well. So, so doing it from inside an organization is, is, is not a, a best practice. And I would say that, you know, you really, I think, have to keep in mind um, a very fundamental truth, which is that, you know, no perfect is, is hack proof, no, perf no system is perfect, no trade secret is completely secure. What you really want to do to maximize, in my opinion, your cyber resilience is to have both the good technical controls in place, rigorously tested, as Austin mentioned, but then layer on top of that the good policies and protocols, right, like the incident response plans that we've been talking about, and the good board education, and the good management training, and the good exercises that you have you know, with your employees. That's kind of the right eye, left eye approach that's going to really maximize your cyber resilience. And if you have a cyber event, if you remember nothing else that I told you today, is that your dollars here at law school are well spent. Because if you or your clients have a cyber event of any significant magnitude, the conduct of your organization is not going to be judged by engineers or engineering students or panels of MIT computer scientists. The conduct of your organization is going to be judged by lawyers, okay? Lawyers in robes, we call them judges. Lawyers in suits, we call them regulators. And lawyers in fancy suits, we call them plaintiff's class action counsel, right? <laughs> so you as lawyers uh, and law students are all in the right place because you are going to be the sharp end of the spears in this debate. And that's what's going on now, you know, Target and class actions, now the banks are suing Target and, you know, the consumers and everybody. And I mean, you know, I mean, how many cases, Alex, have you been involved in where the plaintiffs are a panel of MIT computer scientists? Right. They're not. They're, <laughs> they're not. They're, they're not. And, and, and uh, Joe's exactly right that that is both the risk and the fallout and the after effect of breaches and, frankly, what clients need counseling on and get counseling if they get good counseling on in terms of being prepared um, and that goes to the notion of having the lawyers involved in the incident response right if you have your IT professionals running your incident response without lawyers it has a couple consequences number one it's not privileged and so when the plaintiffs class action lawyers come around to start asking for it they get it all because there are no privilege claims uh, number two <coughs> It means that the IT uh, guys and girls like to talk about what ifs. Well, maybe this happened, maybe that happened. And they talk about all kinds of ideas and they write it all down mm -hmm. and they speculate and they say, maybe it was this and maybe it was that person's fault. And, and, you know, and it's all because they're not thinking about the consequence of what's gonna happen when the lawyers get involved and start asking for it. Um, and so, Unfortunately, the reality, and you know, in, in particularly the United States and the litigious society that we have, uh, and the fact the plaintiff's uh, class action bar has gotten so focused on privacy, including the attorneys general, uh, you know, that is a big aspect of the kind of work that we do and the, and the preparedness, quite frankly. And I mean, one thing that I've seen a lot of times, you've probably seen as well, I know you don't do this, but, but what I've seen oftentimes is security professionals, when they're asked to make recommendations, you know, they will do so in pictorial form. Now, there's nothing wrong with pictures, there's nothing wrong with graphs, right? But if you're asked to make recommendations to a client on what things they should be doing, I have found that whereas lawyers tend to write in prose, like here are our recommendations, you know, you might want to think about, you should consider that security technologists, many of whom are engineers, will put things into tabular form with like red, yellow, green, <laughs> red, must do immediately, yellow, you know, very important to do immediately, green, important to do right after immediately, and you know, at an organization which, which cannot, no organization can do all of these things instantly, right? So by definition, if an organization decides that really a red should be a yellow, a yellow should be a green, or they didn't quite get to all the reds by the time the bad red thing happened, you know, now you've got kind of this just exhibit out there and you've got a plaintiff's lawyer who can depose a head of IT, a COO, even a CEO saying, look right here, it says red. You didn't do red. Red's bad and you didn't do it, right? And wave that in front of a jury. And if there's really no educational value in that, it's just kind of a lot of, a lot of heat. Um, so I think, again, you as lawyers are in the right place because by definition, your training you know, brings you to understand the nuances, the textures. Again, I'm not saying, you know, you should write things that are not truthful, it has to be truthful. But what I'm saying is, you see that a lot of the things in this area are a question that is oftentimes better addressed in 
prose format than in red, yellow, green, <laughs> which I've never seen you do. No. Right. Unless a client asks for it. I don't it. use those colors. If they ask for <laughs> it. <laughs> um, Mr. Sello, something you mentioned about um, privileged information. Uh, I wanted to ask you guys how you handle running an investigation once there has been a breach in a way that keeps as much information as possible privileged. So, I mean, there are a few basic rules of thumb, and the first is getting the lawyers involved at the outset and sort of laying down the rules of the road, which is be careful what you communicate in writing. You tend, I mean, what I tend to say is let's get on a conference call. Let's not just send out a whole bunch of emails with a bunch of speculation. Let's get on a conference call. Let's talk it through. Let's figure out what's going on. Let's figure out what our goals are. Let's figure out what we actually need to write down. Um, and then making sure that things are properly denoted as prepared at the request of counsel, or privileged and confidential, so that you can catch it later, right? right? So the issue that comes up, it's not, those are not magic, those don't make it necessarily privileged, but what it does is it allows you to catch those communications later so that a lawyer can look at it and make a determination, yes, this is in fact privileged, and so we are going to put it on a privileged log and not produce it in civil litigation, uh, or maybe they would conclude that it's not, but the point is if you don't flag it in that way, you lose both oftentimes the ability to catch it because in today's day and age, that's the way that people filter through massive quantities of data. And number two, you lose some of the argument that it's privileged if it was not, not denominated that. It's not absolute, but, uh, but that's part of it. And so you wanna set up your systems to make sure, as we say, you're properly bannering your communication and that everybody involved understands the rules of the road and follows them. Um, and frankly, that often involves the first few times it doesn't get followed, calling out the person, not you know, saying, you know, okay, make sure you're saying you did this prepared at the direction of counsel since the counsel told you to do it, but you didn't put that down. You gotta make sure to do that. And those are the basic things. And what you're doing is you're instilling the idea of being careful and not engaging in rampant speculation about what happened and what was lost and who's responsible um, and being, uh, being careful and you know lawyers are trained to be cautious and careful and you bring that thinking to the problem um, you know and oftentimes there are you know other professions who are simply trained differently and they want to throw a bunch of ideas up and see what sticks and that's great um, except when you're dealing with, a, with a, a problem that can ultimately lead to legal consequences and you know, monetary settlements for a company that if you, with a little preparedness, you can avoid. All right, and I mean, I think, you know, especially in this game, you should be aware of the fact that, you know, just because it's privileged, obviously facts are not privileged and, and confidential, and, you know, if you were attacked and hacked by anonymous, you know, that's not a privileged and confidential fact. And some of you may work already, or some of you may go work for clients where, the, where they are regulated entities, either regulated by, you know, let's say a governmental regulatory body, like a state banking department, or by the SEC, or by FINRA, or by a trade association, and those bodies have the authority just to come in and ask for whatever they want. And saying, oh no, it's privilege is not an option because then, let's say if you're a bank, you may not pass your safety and soundness exam. Um, or if you are you know, trying to get into a trade association and the trade association wants you to disclose certain things, they may kick you out. Or your auditors may say, well, you know what, we're not gonna certify the financials until you share with us the following details. So I think it's incumbent upon everyone to you know, understand that just because the document has attorney-client communication or work product on it that, you know, you really still want to be very, very careful in your drafting. And again, I mean, I think it, it, it behooves all of us to remember that a lot of times, you know, that data can be lost, stolen, hacked, or leaked, right? And some of the most embarrassing emails in the Sony hack came from lawyers with lawyers' privilege on them. Um, and had those attorneys, you know, picked up the phone and made a call, again, it probably would not have come out, or at least not have come out that way. And I'll just add one additional uh, issue which was raised in the last panel, which is when you get to the point of reporting an incident to law enforcement, which you know is is a, an issue of some consideration and consultation with clients, typically in these scenarios, and sometimes the recommendation is to do so, sometimes it isn't. Um, then you are again confronted with privilege issues because typically in uh, in a cooperative cooperative mode with law enforcement, a company or a council who have conducted an internal investigation are faced with the issue of trying to disclose that information 
uh, and either waiving privilege thereby or trying to preserve privilege. And I know that you know our friends and colleagues in law enforcement are often frustrated by uh, you know companies that claim uh, that that come in and want to be cooperative, but then are resistant at giving over certain information uh, based on claims of privilege. And that can be a point of some contention and and conversation, uh, hopefully. Uh, but it's again a really important thing, and you have to manage the process and. As lawyers for clients, um, you've got to think about all sides of the problem, uh, and you've got to be cognizant of how you're handling the privilege issues vis-a-vis uh, -vis the government regulators or investigators or even criminal prosecutors and, and agents who are asking for information. And there can be ways to share that while being more uh, cautious with respect to the privilege. There are also ways of just handing it over um, and biting the bullet and deciding you're going to waive privilege. Um, and those are all really specific individualistic determinations. And Mr. Burgos, when you guys are writing up reports, is this something that you think about? Um, is how much to maybe put into a report? Maybe we don't elaborate too much on certain things? Um, or is it something that you guys don't really have to worry about? No, it is. And, and uh, the majority of our, our investigations are uh, be, were retained by Joe and Alex and and, uh, and and firms such as theirs and and we've had instances where we were told no report is to be written uh, and that the results are just given over the phone. Uh, we've had uh, you know instances where they wanted full detailed reports and anywhere in between. So it just depends on we go by the advice of counsel. Interesting. So um, yeah, spear phishing is something that came up in the earlier panel, uh, but so. But I want to hear a little bit about spear phishing, but also what other type of technology are hackers using commonly, um, and how should companies be combating that type of technology? Okay, um, so spear phishing has been a friend of mine for a long time, because um, for those of you who don't know what it is, um, spear phishing, so let's start with phishing. Phishing is, is the act of basically casting a wide net, and I'll use uh, a case that I was associated with when in the FBI and it's now just been in the press, which is the JP Morgan case, um, theft of probably 80 million email addresses. Um, most people will say, that's wonderful, what do you need email addresses for? Well, you can monetize the email addresses and the bad guys who have it now can, they have legitimate 80 million email addresses and now you can cast an enormous net by sending out massive amounts of email to the 80 million people. You can put a whole host of things in those emails. You can put attachments that, are, that have malware, so that if someone clicks on it, now you have, you have compromised their computer. You can tout penny stocks that you've invested in. You can, uh, you can tout uh, online gambling sites that you own. You can tout Viagra. You can tout uh, illegal pharmaceuticals. But now you've just reached 80 million people like that. Um, if 1% of those people click on it and you've got access to the computer, that's a significant pool. Um, the next phase would be the spear phishing, which is targeted. So now I've got a whole host of people who have, um, who have uh, clicked on those links and I've got access to their computer. Um, maybe I send another email out to those individuals and maybe I get a smaller percentage who click on them. And now I start to focus in on each one of those individuals and start tailoring the emails and activity towards them to gain more information. And I'll give you a, an example from my experience. Uh, a few years ago I was the, I was the um, supervisor at the time of the only <coughs> cyber squad in New York and um, there are three ways that people can come in and make a complaint. Citizens can make a complaint to the FBI. They can phone it in they can email or they can physically walk in. And, and you know, our office is downtown uh, Manhattan. It's a large federal building. It, uh, you gotta go through many, many layers uh, to get in. But once you get in, um, if you can do it, you can get an agent to come down and talk to you. So one day I get a phone call at my desk and, and the police officer downstairs says, there's a woman here who wants to talk to an agent. So I select a brand new agent on the squad and I send him down because oftentimes they're some crazy stories. <laughs> so 30 minutes later, the agent calls me up and says, you might want to hear this one, come down. So I go down and I talk to this woman. She's got a stack of, of uh, paper at her desk. And she said, she said, I lost, yesterday, I lost half a million dollars um, on the internet and I need your help getting it back. And I said, well, you're not getting your money back and tell me the story. Maybe we can help you a little bit. 
She said, I have a very niche business and I put an advertisement up on the web. Um, within 30 seconds, I got a response back um, that, uh, that this individual had um, the, the, um, the piece of equipment that I needed. And he said, e uh, wire transfer half a million dollars to X bank account. So she did after taking like three mortgages or a house and borrowing from friends and family. Um, and I said, okay, you know, why did you feel so comfortable wiring half a million dollars to someone you never met before? And she said, well, I had a letter from your organization, from the FBI. And I said, oh, can you show it to me? Mm -hmm. So she pulls out this piece of paper that had the FBI New York letterhead on it, but it was targeted. It was directly towards her. It said, dear Mrs. X, um, please feel free to do business with such and such. My office, meaning the FBI New York, has a relationship with her or him and feel comfortable, we know them, go ahead and, and do business. Signed, at the time, assistant director um, of the office. But the kicker of the whole thing, that there was a picture underneath the assistant director's signature, and I looked and I recognized it, and I turned the paper towards her, and I said, do you know who this is? And she said, no. And I said, it's Bernie Madoff. <laughs> True story. And she didn't know. And uh, so it's a perfect example of, of someone who had needled down on an individual and really got down to, to the, 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 so what would grab her? And, and, and um, you know, I don't know why I put Bernie Madoff on there. Most people knew it, but, <laughs> but uh, I have seen um, multiple stories like that, how easy it is and how susceptible people are. Another common thing is you get uh, uh, corporate execs of companies mm -hmm. who go over to China or Russia or wherever and do business and they sit down and, and they, uh, they, they meet all kinds of people and maybe one of those people has nefarious intentions and, and the CEO or CIO comes back and two weeks later they get an email from a contact they met over there It says, hey Bob, you know, you remember me? I met you at a conference. Take a look at my PowerPoint slide. I want you to, I want you to see if, what you think. And they open up the PowerPoint slide. That CEO who has elevated privileges in their organization now just infected their entire network um, and uh, and it's just that easy so spear phishing needles down it's 80 percent of the uh, of the compromises that we see um, and then coupled with the elevated privileges of these organizations it's the easiest pathway the easiest way that bad actors can get a good foothold inside an organization and so are there any ways that companies can prevent Fishing and especially spear fishing. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's training of employees. Um, uh, and I think pretty you said that you had been tested before on, yeah. <laughs> on the uh, on the spear fishing. Um, K two does it. There are organizations that will um, provide um, spear fishing uh, testing where uh, the organization selects you know a certain percentage of people and we send out uh, well crafted spear fishing or or phishing emails to the organization and it's and you see how many people click on it and some programs if you click on it then you get mandatory training and it's awareness it's um it's 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 increased awareness it's talking about it it's reducing the amount of 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 um, bring your own devices you still have companies who allow people to bring their cell phones and plug it into their corporate network allow people to take their corporate laptops home infect their home network and bring it back and now the virus is transferred back and forth. In fact, Joe and I are working on a case together where this company has a really bad infection and the, and the malware that, that's infecting this organization resides in memory and, and it, it can't be found on a hard disk and what it does is um, it acts as a scout like reconnaissance and if it finds out that anybody's looking for it, it shuts down. And if the coast is clear, it calls out to its friends and brings down the real bad stuff in image files. So that's legitimate image files that passes through antivirus, it's PNG files. It brings it down, and now it infects. And what happens is you get companies who are infected, and they allow their, 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 comp their employees to take the laptops home. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes those laptops have the malware. They take it, they infect their home network, and then the next day they come back to work, the company has cleaned the network, but they bring their infected laptop from home back in and now they go through it all again. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge vicious circle, cycle of samsara, and it's very tough to get out of. And um, you know, it's, uh, 
it, it's a huge problem. But yeah. the human the human factor, spear phishing, is the is the number one cause of of, of all the hacks that and, we see. And I don't think you realize how bad it is because most of the kind of headline grabbing stories involve kind of mass spills of PII, right? The Target, the Home Depot. You know things where you know lots of people have lost their bank account numbers. These these kind of infections are many of them are much more B two B as opposed to B two C. And so you're having let's say a, 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 a I mean I'm representing now a company a major major company which lost over a million dollars as a result of a fraudulent wire transfer which was affected as a result of a spear phishing attack directed against a couple of internal employees. And you know the, the bad guys are very, very good. They had code and malware that they deployed that made the bank's secure portal website um, appear to be coming up when the internal people in the controller's office went to visit the bank's website. It was actually a website that they had spoofed and faked, right? So now the controller and the assistant controller, who are both you know using dual factor authentication tokens, are entering in the secure credentials to a fake website, which has been kind of set up between them and the outside world and in front of the real bank's website. Although the instructions were then passed to the real bank's website and the money's transferred on to the bad guys. So you don't hear about it as much because it doesn't involve these kind of mass publicly reported data spills of PII, but I will tell you that there's a lot of businesses that are losing money, oftentimes in six and seven figure amounts as a result of the fact that you know, some privileged person inside the organization was compromised. And just to sort of go back to Brittany's first question about the sort of technology, I mean, all of this is the development of new technologies. I mean, if you think, if it, if, if in order to do a transaction at the bank, they actually had to go to their physical branch and see the teller who they had to visit every day and they knew, then this wouldn't happen, right? But the reality is that the convenience of online banking is here to stay, and so you have to sort of just deal with that reality. Um, and it's true, you know, across uh, the globe. If you know companies <coughs> want efficiency, companies want to save money and not and, and allow people to use their own devices, um, and companies want their network uh, accessible remotely because then people don't have to have physical space and that saves money, or they can get them working at night and get more productivity out of people. I mean, all of those reasons for um, driving sort of you know corporate efficiency are driving our the convenience element. Um, you know, people they some companies still resist dual factor authentication because it's too inconvenient. You could have lots of other even stricter uh, protocols, but it 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 prevents access in a way that is that the price is too high, and so it's all really a balance. <coughs> Um, and you have to think about balancing and then prevention behind. So you do your training with spear phishing, but at the same time, you make sure that people don't have uh, you know, broad access, right? So we, I've dealt with companies where the CEO gets spear phishing and the CEO had administrative access rights because they're like, oh, they're the CEO, they should have administrative <laughs> access rights. It's idiotic, right? The CEO doesn't need administrative <laughs> access rights because they wouldn't even know what to do with it. But somebody thought it was a good idea and nobody right. questioned them. You know, or maybe the CEO said I should have it, and you know, and got it. Um, but there, there, there are a number of steps behind the curtain that one can do to try to prevent, uh, if somebody gets in, to prevent the, you know, the exfiltration of data, or at least catch it quickly, which can help to limit the damage. Yeah, and it sounds like there are so many different ways to, to get this data out from uh, companies, even when it's protected, but is it easy or difficult, or how, how difficult is it to tell the difference between when it was an external actor or an internal actor after breaches happen? It's hard. I mean, it's, look, I mean, you know, it's hard, it's not impossible. Sometimes you know right away. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you never find out. Sometimes yeah. it takes a long period of time. Yeah. And has that changed the way you guys proceed if you know that it's, you know who did it or you don't know who did it? I mean, those, those, those are among the first critical questions, right? I mean, the first critical question is what happened? What was exposed? How was it exposed? Because that leads to are we still exposed? Right. And what, you know, one among the first things you want to do is you want to make sure whatever gaps or holes there are are plugged so that, you know, your information, your data, your money doesn't continue to leak out the back door. Right. So from that, you have to figure out as quickly as possible what happened. And I will we'll just make one additional point on that, which is, 
you have to resist, and lawyers are very helpful in this, resist the urge to jump to the conclusion quickly. Right. In this area, it is you are always finding more logs or finding more additional information. And one of the pressures of the regulators or of the, you know, the public relations or the CEO or the management you know, or the need to respond to data breach uh, uh, statutes obligations is something happened, let's figure it out immediately, oh, this must be what happened, let's go public. And that's often the worst thing you can do because these kinds of investigations take time. They're, you know, you've gotta get down in the weeds and you've gotta really analyze the logs and, and, and try to figure it out and that's the kind of stuff that Austin does every day. It's not the kind of thing that you can just do immediately and so you have to take the time to, to do that. Yeah, and, and I think, uh, you know, everybody after an incident immediately wants to know who did it, attribution. We say that's not your first concern. Containment, eradic eradicating them, getting them rid, stop the bleeding, and then let's talk about right. um, who did it. Um, the most important thing is getting back up and running and, and, and making sure your business stays afloat. Yeah. More yeah. important than attribution. Right. I mean, and I will just add that the vast majority of incidents still involve you know, sort of easy attributions, like the person got their car stolen, had a laptop in right. it that was not encrypted, or they sent out a misdirected email. You know, they you know they they were they were walking down the street and they responded to an HR list of a bunch of HR data, and they auto filled you know some you know buddy you know some parent on their kid's soccer team, and boom, that's out. Right? Those are actually easy attributions, and that is still the vast majority of sort of regular data breach incidents, some of which involve trade secrets, some of which don't, but the more sophisticated stuff where the, where the bad actors are trying to get at the real crown jewels, those are much more challenging and frankly interesting and, and uh, problematic for clients at the same time. And you might have, you know, you might also have a blended scenario in a trade secret case where you have an insider and an outsider. I mean, I, I, I was involved in, in uh, an investigation involving an insider at a company, a proprietary uh, FX trading firm who stole the secret trading code and algos from the company, and he was going to work on uh, on a competing business with an outsider who happened to be his roommate from MIT. Um, so one person had very deep connections inside the organization; other, the other person had no connection at all to the organization. Um, I mean, look, there are things you there are options you have if you know that it's an insider, right? I mean, if you know that it's an insider, you can ask to interview them in a conference room. It's kind of hard to do that with anonymous. I mean, like you know, they're hard to find to begin with. But but for the most part, a lot of the things you know, your your breach reporting laws are probably not going to be impl implicated by whether or not the bad act was caused by an insider or outsider. Your obligations to business partners. I mean, in a trade secret case, you might have obligations to notify business partners if a trade secret has been lost that's critical to your business. JV partners, you might have you know, obligations to, under the securities laws, if you are a company that its main, you know, main uh, asset is the secret sauce IP that was just stolen, you may have you know, reporting obligations under the Securities and Exchange Act to issue investor guidance on that. Now that's not gonna depend on whether or not the insider you know, made that trade secret public and was trying to sell it on the black market, or whether it was stolen by some guy or gal who hacked in from the outside. So you have some options, you know, if it's an insider that you may not have it if it's an outsider. You may have some options if it's an outsider that you don't have it if it's an insider. Um, but the kind of many of the things you're gonna be needing to do as a result of legal obligations are probably not gonna change, not gonna matter much as between the two. Okay, well, um, I would like to open up the floor for questions, if anyone has any. Uh, yeah. We'll get the microphone in just a second. Hello. Um, you've mentioned a lot of great ways to um, assess preventative measures with clients, um, whether it be um, employing a vulnerability test or asking the right questions or assessing um, what type of client you have, whether it be a startup or a Fortune 500 company. Um, is there any valuation that you place on trade secrets in order to um, advise the clients on what preventative measures they can take in a cost-effective way? I don't know of any kind of rule of thumb. Like, for example, I, I wouldn't say that, well, if your trade secret is worth you know, $480 million, you should spend like, you know, 10 basis points protecting it. What I would say, I, I would say to the client is, look, think for a moment what would happen 
if this trade secret of yours was just put up on a website where anybody could go get it? What is, what is, the, next, what is you know, the day one value of your company? And if they say, well, it goes from now, a $125 million company, a company that's worth that, to $2 million, I'd say, well, you know, then, then let's try and make sure that that doesn't happen. I mean, you know, obviously you're never going to spend that budget in protecting it, but I think if you ask the question that way, and if it's, I mean, obviously companies can have dozens of trade secrets, right? You can begin to have that kind of conversation, which I think is so important to have. Yeah, and I guess I would add that a lot of clients, um, you know, trade secrets, at least from a client perspective and as representing clients, are often in the eye of the beholder. Yes. Um, ultimately, they may be in the eye of a judge, uh, either as a trade secret or not. But we often get the situation where clients come and say, X has gone or this employee has left and taken X. You know, and then as our job as advocates is to uh, assess it, make a judgment about whether we can make the argument that it's trade secret and take certain actions with respect to that. And you know, quite frankly, that's part of the interest of this area of the law is that the definitions are somewhat malleable. And so one can make those kinds of arguments about customer lists, about marketing plans. I was involved in, I had a, I had a trade secrets trial uh, last year in Delaware Chancery Court, which was basically about marketing materials. We were plaintiff. We asserted they were very valuable secrets. The other side said they were a bunch of marketing PowerPoints, like no big deal. Right? I mean, that's part of the part of the intersection of what one discusses about that. And the issue, the reason our client fought for what they did was less about the value of the item um, and more about the principle of it. And frankly, it was an employee defection case, and so it was more about protecting against other employee defections and uh, sort of the principle and the deterrent value of it. So, you know, valuation takes lots of different forms um, and it's not so much about how much is this uh, being valued. I, I mean, I'll just add one other uh, story. When I was in the office, you may remember uh, the, the case of Ill Will. Yes. Uh, Will Genovese, who, uh, who offered for sale the, a stolen copy of the source code for Microsoft Windows. So this was, in fact, the legitimate source code of Microsoft Windows. And uh, he offered it for sale for $20. Right. Um, jacked the code. Yes, he had jacked the code. <laughs> and he had the misfortune of acknowledging in his post that he knew it was stolen and offering it for money. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and because he knew it was stolen, we got around the issue of whether he had lost trade secret protection because it was, of course, available on the internet because he had gotten it off of a dark website. So his defense was, well, it's not a trade secret anymore because uh, it was public. Uh, he didn't even make it. He was a second order trade secret. that Somebody else had made it public. He got it off there, but he knew it was jacked and as he acknowledged. So, uh, he was still convicted. And then the question was, how do you value that? And it was, I mean, you know, if you could do the valuation, it's billions of dollars. I mean, the Microsoft Windows, it's a billion dollar product. Uh, and, you know, that wasn't what we used for sentencing purposes. We um, wanted to. Yes, we did want to. And your but, old office is probably using that same version, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Still to this exactly. day. Exactly. So, you know, but, it, but, but it's a good point about what, how you quantify it. And it goes back to what we were talking about at the outset is how do you value these things and how do you try to protect them, um, you know, in light of the cost that it does take to protect them. Are there any other questions? All right, well, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you also to our wonderful panelists. Um, please feel free to stick around. So this concludes our panel board of the evening. You'll have a reception uh, behind you all. On behalf of Brooklyn Law School and the Trade Secrets Institute, we'd like to give our warmest thank you to the panelists who provided some really excellent conversation tonight. Um, we invite you to check out our blog, which is tsi.brooklaw.edu. That's where we post all of the uh, case information. And for those students out there who are interested in the institute and becoming fellows, please either stop Brittany, Robin, or I, or Professor Beecham if you want to talk about uh, the opportunities that are out there. Thanks, guys. Thanks.